Olá pessoal, boa tarde, sejam todos bem-vindos à segunda parte do nosso primeiro dia do encontro de férias SBS. Antes de começar a palestra, eu queria anunciar a ganhadora do nosso sorteio do kit com 15 jogos de cartas da BOC. Ela cumpriu com todos os requisitos, eu acabei de ver um comentário dela aqui na página, inclusive. Parabéns, Caroline Parcianello Peirotti, eu espero ter falado o seu nome corretamente. É, a gente vai entrar em contato com você pelo Instagram para pegar todos os seus dados para envio do seu prêmio. E agora é, a gente vai voltar aqui para falar da Marcela, a palestra da Marcela. Então, de novo, sejam todos bem-vindos, né? Welcome everybody. Uh, we're going to start with Marcela Sintra from Brastiso, the president of Brastiso, and she's going to talk about affective learning. Uh, she's going to to give some uh, surprises after the lecture ends. Okay. Thanks a lot, everybody. Marcela, it's it's all to you. Thank you, Barbara. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. I was having a look at the chat, and I know you come from all over Brazil, and some of you are not even in Brazil. So welcome. I hope to um, be able to give you insights and ideas and questions for us to keep learning. I think this is SCBS's purpose with the event, and it's definitely Brassy Soul's uh, mission to have everyone developing, all of us uh, English language teachers, developing for life, right? So today we're going to talk about um, effective learning. I'm going to um, share my slides with you in a second. But there is a very, very important thing I would like to ask you before, I would like to say before, which is um, for you to send your questions to um, Barbara in the chat if you do have any questions as we are talking, okay? Uh, Barbara is actually in charge. I think it's Barbara uh, and no, nobody else. She's going to be in charge of looking at the, the comments and asking me the questions as we go, okay? Uh, so you don't worry about interrupting me. She she has the um, carte blanche to interrupt me anytime she feels like um, it's going to help you and everybody with the... Um, with the, the question, okay? Especially because of the topic. Like Barbara said, we are going to be talking about effective learning, some of uh, the tips, and we're going to actually go ahead with the idea that this is for effective teachers as well, and effective teachers um, as well. So um, I hope it helps everybody. And um, I always say this, but I'm going to reinforce this. There is nothing here that I will say that is actually written in stone or not questionable or anything. But everything I say is actually supposed to make you question uh, or help you question what you do uh, in terms of teaching or in terms of beliefs and everything. And I hope it helps um, us do that this year. So our agenda is, our agenda is very simple. At the same time, there are lots of things for us to do. We're going to go into the what, why, and how. It is in order, but not necessarily in order because they actually intertwine, right? Um, what is affect is going to actually inform why we are doing that in education and what's the impact in language learning and how we can do that as teacher, as teachers, everything comes together. Um, but I hope the ideas are in order for us to take notes or ask questions um, as we go, okay? So first thing is obviously the what. And we start by defining a little bit what I mean when I say affect or effective learning um, for English language teachers or for education in general. And the very important thing is it does not mean, although there are many hearts, just love your students and be happy. That's definitely not what it means. It's part of that, but um, what it really means deep inside is that we bring or we should bring uh, to light the emotions and the personal and humanistic um, aspect 
uh, of all our learners into the classroom. The diversity of expectations, the diversity of uh, learning um, preferences, choices, expectations, difficulties, um, the anxiety that comes with learning, and, and also the fact, I think this is the most important, the bottom line of it all, uh, the fact that anybody in the equation of learning, anybody uh, will bring something and has something to add to the other people involved. So when you learn as an individual, you're going to bring something and there is less debate in terms of learning than when you learn as a group. They're both very good. But if you add somebody, you also add something else, something different that is going to bring and provoke in the teaching and learning environment different things. And affect is or effective learning is actually bringing it all to the classroom and not necessarily focusing solely on the content of what we teach um, the language, uh, as we say, right? And some questions for us to start here. Do I mean by effective learning that it does not affect or is not related to teacher effectiveness or the seriousness of the profession of teaching or it has no relation with ethics? Or is the affect part of the occasion or knowledge and affect come separately or cognition for that matter comes separately um, what exactly is that and since we are defining it we are one person we don't have an effective somebody and a serious person to teach or to learn for that matter and the knowledge is in the same brain we have the emotions so it all comes together I mean, it, I know it sounds very funny as I say it, but it, it's really not. We are one person and everybody comes, and everything comes together to the classroom, to the learning equation and environment. So everything is not actually disconnected. Everything is completely connected. But these are not my words. That this is not me saying, okay? It's just to reinforce that the seriousness of the materials, what we are teaching, the cognition, the thinking, the um, knowledge can and should allow for positive emotions or negative emotions because we cannot deny all of any of them, right? Um, they will bring in the magic of learning as a whole person, not uh, simply looking at the book as everybody used to do um, in the past, and this is learning, right? Uh, but these are not my words, as I said, they're Freire's words. And you have here the quote from Pedagogia da Autonomia in Portuguese. I didn't translate this one. Just for our reference, we don't need to read it together. But this is basically what he means that the emotions and the affect or the effective aspect of learning and teaching is not detached from the knowledge and cognition, okay? But rather should come together. And it doesn't mean, like I said at the beginning, that if you like a student, you're going to assess that student uh, better than someone you dislike. There is no liking or disliking students. It's for everybody. It's a democracy in a way um, of teaching. Also in Freire's words, and then, this is very important in the what we do. Uh, whoever, this is a belief I have, whoever teaches learns in the act of teaching. That's why we are here. We're always learning. We, I say, because I also learn from you, from your questions and, um, and whatever you have to add. And I hope we all uh, learn together. And whoever learns also teaches, right? So. Every, everybody in the classroom adds something. So this will bring us to the why, right? The what is um, rather simpler in a way because it summarizes all the effective aspects of what we are doing. And we come to the why. Why should we then look at effective learning, including it, everybody? Because I know, believe me, it's really hard 
really hard for us to go into the classroom. I don't know how many of you are teaching uh, public education, for example, where you have 50 uh, students sometimes in the classroom for the first class, right? But then you have 10 other groups to, to deal with 500 students every uh, period of your, of your life, sometimes every day. And how is that possible or why should we do that? And I'm not saying here that it is any easier when we know what we're doing. It makes it more difficult. The more knowledge we have, the more we start questioning what we are doing. And this makes it a little bit more dangerous than, um, than doing it simply in the autopilot, right? But if it were easy, anybody in the whole world could claim to, to be a teacher. And let's go back to what Freire said, it's not only about the knowledge. So knowing the language doesn't make us teachers. Knowing um, the techniques, knowing how to work with technology doesn't make us teachers. Lots of different things put together and studying to become a teacher, like people study to become a doctor, this makes us teachers, right? So why? This is part of why it is. Uh, if we're dealing with human beings, we have to look at them as human beings, not objects, inanimate objects to which I just preach. Which brings me to my complaint somehow about what we do or what we've been doing with lots of webinars and everything. I know they are very useful because they are going to be recorded. It's uh, forever. We can discuss this later and everything. But it's so hard for me to not to have the interaction uh, here with you. And I hope you bear with me because then I tend to speak as everybody else is silent in a way, right? Why then? First, why is why did we start teaching? Why did you start teaching? Why did you? decide to keep teaching, right? And I actually ask, even though I don't teach as frequently as I used to, I'm still involved with teaching, but not uh, with the learners so much, as much as I used to, I always ask myself this, these two questions and every single day I go back to this image. I'm not sure you've seen this before in any other um, talk, this is the reason why I became a teacher. This is me in the middle. I studied in a, in a public school here in Sao Paulo. And we uh, had this fake graduation after preschool when we were uh, seven, we were six going on seven. And I'm in the middle, right in the first uh, line there, front row, um, looking at the audience because my teacher told me, you need to be confident. You've learned so much, everyone. Look at the audience, smile and sing. And I felt it was so magical that I did exactly what the teacher said. And some of my colleagues were looking at the teacher, as you can see. The teacher's not in the picture, but they were looking at her. And she is, was actually, the role model of everything I tell you today. She taught us many different things, how to draw, how to um, recognize the letters and numbers, how the, the books were magical and they brought different stories, different things. And she did that with a pinch of affection in everything she did and affect in the sense of bringing diversity to the classroom. Beginning on the first day, this was back in 1980, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And she looked at us and said, you have tables of four people because here nobody is alone. And that's what we did for the whole year. And we had to learn to work with everyone in the classroom. She would sometimes um, obviously swap pairs and groups and we would be angry at her as children, right? Because we have our preferences. And she would care and acknowledge our anger, but never say, okay, you're angry, just stay with whoever you want to do it. She would teach us how to behave differently then. So it's not that she didn't acknowledge what we wanted, she did, but it didn't mean that she had to abide for anything we asked for, right? 
So that was my reason for started, starting um, the career or the passion for it. And since we are talking about the past, let's go back a little bit more. There is also an emotional base in everything we learn, and we're going to see more recent research on that. So you see the whys, everybody has been talking about that and doing and helping us learn more as we go. And if we don't bring these emotions, it might complicate things a bit. I like this fact and its research on um, motivation and, and the emotions there. The beginning of it, it is now apparent and the now apparent that learning will actually be strengthened by activating the potential through emotions and imagination and the senses. You can help people learn better. But this has been said, or this was said 30 years ago, and it has been said so by so many different people. We looked at uh, Freire, or we looked at Plato and different people, and somehow our tests, our schools, or our system still values, uh, value lots of content over any learning, right? It's just going through. So we have to be careful not to uh, fall prey to that um, all the time. It's really difficult, but we can do it. And then to talk a little bit more um, about the situation nowadays, because I said, okay, it's 30 years ago, but what do we do now, Marcella? Because 2020 did happen and we're not, many of us are not um, in the physical classroom at the moment. And some of us are with half the students, others are there with fewer students and others are not even close to, to going back and so on and so forth. Things happened and they're different. And I would like to talk about the opportunities as well. If we look at this picture and you're uh, thinking about any context, think for a second, is this a teacher or a student? Now that you've thought for a second, because I could not see your, your um, answers there, but I hope you, you thought for a second, we arrive at one of the whys and why this is even more important now. Uh, if we look at this picture, it's obviously a shutterstock picture, not a picture I took, but it represents the biggest opportunity we have in um, using more of what we learn about effective teaching. This person sitting in front of the computer could be either a teacher or a student. I have no idea and there is nothing that will tell me whether she's a teacher or a student thinking about these two possibilities only, obviously, because we are talking about teaching. We are away from the classroom, from the traditional classroom, where anybody coming in would most usually be able to identify, oh, that's the teacher, either because the teacher is standing or because the students are sitting in rows and the teacher is facing them. Or So in many different classrooms, it's very easy for us to identify who is who. And now we have the opportunity of going back and questioning a little bit of our environment in, in towards effect there to learn or to consider that we do have an opportunity of mixing it a little bit more and making the students more participative or more active in their role of um, teaching and learning as well. We still have the possibly have the magic wand that will organize perhaps or facilitate uh, the, the teaching and learning process, especially if we are dealing with kids. But that doesn't mean they are not uh, part of the magic um, themselves, right? So the, 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 the exercise is there to make us think of the opportunity because we don't have 
a traditional classroom. If we're using whatever platform you're using, we'll have everyone in rectangles looking the same size, um, with the same opportunities with a microphone, unless obviously you mute everyone. But we don't want uh, everybody to be on mute all the time, right? So this might be an opportunity for us to rethink some of our habits so that when we go back to the classroom, we can use a couple of things we learn in uh, during the pandemic. I know it's a disaster in many, many ways, but it does bring us an opportunity to question a little bit more what we've been doing, right? And then uh, still in the wise, thinking of positive uh, discipline or positive responses, non-violent um, communication. That, that's a very good question. I like this question very much because it is a crazy idea that we have, or it is something we've been taught to believe and just propagate and spread the idea that if you want people to perform better in school, you have to punish them. You have to feel to make them feel bad about what they are doing, and then they are going to do better. I, I have no idea uh, how people have this idea. I do have obviously some ideas because we, we study some of the theories, etc. But if you look at theory that tests the opposite and not very um, not 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 very new ones. We we also have um, other theories a little while ago or people researching how students would react when they are actually being made to feel better about what they do or about their mistakes or ask questions and instigate more questions and provoke critical thinking and provoking um, curiosity more than saying this, this is wrong. And it has to do not only what, with what we do in the classroom, as I said before, but with the assessment, with the way we assess our students, because there is no use um, doing lots of questioning and thinking and building and um, acknowledging everyone's participation, dealing with diversity. And then on the day of the test, we give them a standardized test or different ones. We have to question that. I know it's not easy to, to change overnight, okay? Um, but then giving them a standardized test when I know some of my students will not perform well in that kind of test, multiple choice, for example, because that's not uh, how they think better. Whereas if I ask them the questions without, without the multiple choice, they would probably perform better or something like that. So thinking about a multi-modality assessment process, because you can have that. What you cannot have is only one, because only one will benefit part of our students, right? So things for us to think about in helping people feel good about themselves and about what they do, what they do and about learning, right? And the anxiety we cause people when we make them feel bad has different, the anxiety, no, we don't cause the anxiety necessarily, right? We can avoid it, but we are anxious anyway. I'm, I'm, I'm an anxious person. <laughs> And this causes some reaction. So being aware, remember what I said, not ignoring, but being aware of what, what students bring might help us. So they might be the introvert in the classroom or they might not feel very motivated. So if I don't understand that the emotions are part of learning, I might misjudge my students, the quiet ones, the ones that feel bad about themselves and just label them as these ones don't learn and these ones are the best students in the world. What are we doing? Let's go back to why are we teaching? We're teaching everybody, not just the best students, best students, uh, and not just the worst students and not just 
we are teaching everybody, right? So we need to acknowledge everything in the classroom. How? How can we do it? Remember what I said at the beginning, that many of the things I was going to say were not aimed at giving you answers, but more questions. Bear this in mind, because um, if you expect me to give you a formula, I might not have one. I have many different ideas and we have to test lots of different ideas. And the how will depend on your context, specific context, your students, um, the kind of classroom you have, the environment you have, the school you teach in, um, what you need to teach or your objectives, your aims there. Um, everything is mixed to, to bring us a how that goes or addresses your needs specifically as a teacher and as a group of learners, right? So there, there is no recipe, but there are many different ideas. And there is a starting point. The first starting point is, again, the question. Uh, what do I want my learners to achieve? Do, do I want them to improve their communication skills? Or do I want them to be better at taking exams? It will depend on the context, right? What kind of teacher do they need to be able to achieve that? And with these questions, I go to the third one. How? How can I develop into that teacher? I think these questions um, in our minds will help us or will inform what we need in order to organize our development for the year or towards more effective learning, towards more personalized learning and, and everything, right? Um, and with these questions in mind, we start where we are in terms of knowledge, skills, our attitudes and the awareness we have. But remember, first thing I said with this slide, we start where we are and the heart to remind us of the effective uh, learning and effective everything is there to remind that it starts with us. If we do not look at ourselves and we do not understand ourselves as a human being in that equation, it's very difficult for us to model the behavior we want to um, encourage in our students for that matter. So know thyself, uh, know what you know about teaching, what you know about effective learning, what you know about uh, the skills you need and how much you've developed those skills, what, how good you are in doing a couple of things and how much you need to learn other things. And know thyself also means that sometimes you might know everything, but the skills that are more challenging to you, you can choose not to emphasize. You want to emphasize the ones you have and the ones you are stronger at and develop a little bit of the others. It's okay. We're human beings, we're not machines. So we cannot actually have um, a teacher who's good at doing anything in the world in terms of teaching, obviously. Hi, Marcela. Hi. Oh. Hi, uh, Marcio Roverotto de Oliveira has a question. He is asking, how can we draw a line to separate honest feedbacks, the reality checks, from making our students feeling bad about themselves? Thank you, Marcio. Um, from experience and research, Marcio, um, that's a very good question. I love it. And it has to do with the attitude that it's not the what you're going to say that's going to make students feel bad. It's the how. It's in the emotion. So if you know your students, let's start with the, the attitude down there. If you know your students, you know they are anxious about learning, you know that anything can make them feel bad, but you still need to give them feedback on mistakes, on attitudes, on whatever. You start with the how you want to do that. For example, if you have a more reflective uh, student that might feel good about thinking that they know the answers, 
you might want us to ask them a um, question instead of telling them. Um, but not, it, it's not a rhetorical question, okay? It, actually, it's something that will provoke thinking, uh, a probing question. So this is one way of going about that. It really depends on the learner. Um, depending on the learners, they will feel good about themselves if they have an example of what they are supposed to do, be it a language mistake or uh, something they did uh, bad in, in terms of attitude, but modeling the good use of that instead of saying, this is wrong. So if you say, this is wrong, it doesn't tell them anything. It doesn't inform them on how to correct and how to act on that. The how is very important and the what needs to contain an expectation or, or a provocation on how they're going to correct that, how they're going to act on that in terms of improving. If it's, for example, if it's um, a speech in, in English language teaching and they, they are advanced students and they used like two sentences, that's my opinion, sit down. Is it enough uh, for a debate or provoke them? Um, it really depends on who they are, their age, their uh, preferences and, and their skills. But ask them a question, let's work on this. It's really good, but we can do it better. We can go beyond and you can do it. Reassure them that they can do better, whatever the case. Have I answered your question, Marcio? Barbara, you let me know if I answered his question, okay? <laughs> Oh, uh, I guess he still didn't answer that, but you can go on if he... No, I'll, I'll go back to that, okay? Oh, so yeah, he, he just said, yes, you have answered his oh, okay, question. Okay, 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 good. Thank you, Mars. So, but we can get this back later on. But it's not... The important thing is, it's not necessarily the what you say. It's not the negative or constructive in that, man, uh, in that way feedback, but the how. Okay, that has to address that student's uh, need. Okay, needs. Right. If we look at those knowledge, uh, skills, awareness, and um, attitudes, we need to look at knowledge of effective learning, or like Marsha said, we need to know our students as well, right? So we know for from research, right, that the emotions they are actually going to make us pay attention and uh, i said it has to do with what marcia said because if we connect positively to that student they're probably going to learn or they're probably going to listen to what we have to say okay so you start with a positive connection and they're going to pay attention but that also means that if I make them feel bad about what they did, about something or about themselves, you might make them pay attention to other things, things that they don't want to do. For example, um, I mentioned a very positive example of my teacher in preschool and I had other examples, but it could have been a teacher making us feel bad about ourselves and that would possibly give us an example of behaving badly in society or something you don't want to do, right? But not necessarily the language that we want to teach them in our case, okay? So positively connecting helps them um, pay attention and learn or focus on what you want them to focus on, you know, using what they like, etc. or starting, it's not the sandwich, and again, I'll go back to Marcia's question because it's really good. Uh, it's not lying to students. Honesty is also part of the effective uh, learning because you actually acknowledge what the person is, what the person did or how they did it this time, but it doesn't define anybody. So we know that our mistakes, they are part of who we are, they're part of what our actions and everything, but they don't define you forever. So we learn, we're in constant growth, right? Good. 
uh, I give myself feedback, you see, very positive feedback. Anxiety. We were talking about anxiety in the classroom, and this might give us an idea there as well. We can help them succeed. So via feedback, via what we do, this may help us um, or may spare them from the anxiety that comes with language learning. Um, for those of us teaching in Brazil, we have groups of people, students, adult students or young adult students, um, teenagers, different contexts, right? We cannot look at a bubble where uh, children and teenagers are learning English. This is a bubble because if we go around Brazil, this is not true everywhere. Um, so many people reaching a certain age when they've been through years of English language um, studying and they cannot speak, they cannot use, maybe they could have or they, they are still learning or doing. So this adds to their anxiety. And when they reach our classroom, knowing the story may help us encourage them to go beyond. Okay, you haven't learned this so far, but it doesn't mean you will never learn. Our brains are plastic. We can learn. I mean, neuroscience says that we can teach ourselves to learn and, and grow and, and put new things and everybody has this potential. So how do we tap into the potential and help them? Cooling in the classroom. Oh no, okay, good. Um, oh, sorry to interrupt you no, again, no. Stella. Uh, Susana Estevanato is asking if you have any tips on how to help students uh, with low self-esteem or low confidence in themselves during conversation. Yeah, I have some from experience as well, not necessarily only from, from uh, theory. Susana, um, I have this one student, well, working in a uh, private language school, I had the, the advantage was that I had I've always had diverse groups of students, students coming from all all different backgrounds and everything. And I remember this one student who would keep quiet. I remember her name even. It was 17 years ago. And her name was Britta. She was 13. And she came to this beginner's lesson. I'm going to tell you a story and give you some ideas. And she was um, shy, and I say shy in inverted commas because she looked shy because she wouldn't answer the questions, she would never put her hand up, and, and she would participate very little. And one day, uh, after two, three lessons, she was really quiet, and I noticed that she wouldn't um, actually participate, even if I nominated her in a whole group. And one day, she was um, doing the individual work, and I came to her and just said, Rita, this is really good. And she looked at me and said, do you think so? And I said, yes, look at look at your notebook, right? It was um, a writing she was drafting. And then she said, thank you, first day. Second day, she came into the classroom and said hello to everybody. And I said, hi, Rita, sat down, pair work, Everybody that came closer, she was quiet again. And I said, Rita, what do you think? And she looked at me and said, I don't know. I have to think. And she started saying something and giving her opinion. And in the end, she and she used to be a, you know, those bad students performing badly in, in speaking and tests and everything. And she started shining. And I said, um, Rita, always calling her, right? And I said, Rita, what actually happened um, to, to the composition? It's so much better, etc. She looked at me and said, you know why I'm performing better? Because you believed I could. For that student, the fact that I acknowledged something positive in what she said and what she wrote changed, it was a game changer for all her performance in everything. For other students, and then I'm not going to tell the stories because of time constraints, right? But we can share the stories. For other students, some things that really worked, and I, I rushed through the end because I started crying. 
Uh, what really works is giving them a chance to speak and to give their opinion, not pressuring them in whole group, for example, if you have a large group. And sometimes it will depend, okay, you have to look at the, the student because there is no right answer, right? But it will depend on the profile of the student, whether there are no um, special needs and, and different um, variables there. But you can get them to talk to somebody who's not the extreme in, in confidence, okay? Because sometimes this may bring the student to feel bad about themselves just by comparison. And they will never be able to reach that in their work instantly, but little by little. So varying who they work with and find out whether there is a student who might work um, better for the beginning and then moving on and growing in that. Uh, Susanna, let me know if I answered your question, okay? That's very important also. Barbara will let me know. Uh, talking about that, Susana, oh, sorry. Oh, Susana still didn't answer, but Ronaldo Pinheiro has another question. Yes. Uh, to know uh, how to engage grown-up students through effective learning. Yeah, grown-up students are tricky in a way for people. I think this is the, the, the question we all get. Oh, but how do I do that with adults? Because we are always so full of ourselves and etc. cetera. Uh, Believe me, if I started saying that we learn forever, this is true for our learners as well. And with adults, we have um, a lot more anxiety and a lot more um, history and background in, in terms of language learning, in terms of uh, learning, in terms of classroom and everything. So start by knowing who they are and what engages them the most. If, if it's talking about something different, if it is um, working on the book or building what they want to do and what they want to say, you find this answer by trying different things and, and try to get to know them, okay, uh, Ronaldo. Usually, uh, not necessarily talking directly or assuming. Assuming things is very dangerous. If you assume this is engaging and you get to the classroom, and they don't like it, or they don't want to do it, or they don't want to read it, it might not help. So know them and always understand why, why you're doing the task, why they, they have to do this reading, or how this is going to help them, why is this going to be helpful to them. With adults, the, the reasons why they need that might be even more evident than with children. It should be true for everyone, but for the adults, they've got this history, we've got history, right? So we, we want to know the whys, etc. Barbara, let me know if Susanna is okay and Ronaldo is okay, right? Yeah, Susanna said she's okay. Ronaldo, I guess he's still answering. And there's another question. Everybody's uh, is uh, I love the no problem. Yeah, uh, Mariana Azevedo asks how to teach a class with a teen student with microcephaly without excluding anyone. It is a delicate okay. situation until now, especially that he, uh, he has cognitive problems. Yeah. What, what's the name of the, the teacher, please, uh, Barbara? Oh, Mariana Azevedo is the teacher. Okay, Mariana. Mariana, this is a very, very special case, and we have to actually understand the group and the student in that case. Um, to include everyone, you were right, absolutely right. Uh, I think you've got the... The, the first step already, which is including uh, your teen student who has um, special needs, does not mean excluding the others, but it will mean we have to look, we can look at that together um, later and ask for help in, in um, from specialists and everything, but you will actually start your path by looking at how to help the group understand that this other student is part of the group. Um, I'll, I'll give you a completely different example. Um, a student of mine was in regular school. He was studying with uh, someone who um, 
with Down syndrome. And the teacher obviously read, that's why I said you have to understand what the conditions are for that student and, and what you need to do, right? But the, the teacher had this, the, the, the medical report in her hands, read everything, included the students, and she was part of the group. And she would do some activities with a teacher, um, physical activities and everything, because she, she had um, some fine motor skills um, issues. And they would do everything as a group. And when his mother asked me, and, and uh, I heard this because um, they, they were in school, and her mother, his mother said, but what about your friend, blah, 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 uh, because she, she, she needs a different thing in the group. Is she doing this with you? It was a special party and with the posters and everything. He looked at her and said, and this is your aim, okay? He said, what special issues? She's a student in our group. And I think this is what we want to reach. It's very difficult, but include it in a way that we understand that despite any differences and everybody in the group is different in a different way, right? Uh, so learning about the special needs is going to help you include and include the, uh, the others in the whole group there. But we can look at the specific case because we cannot, as I said, one answer will not fit all cases, right? And uh, I think this is particularly important in effective um, learning what's on um, the, the screen right now, which is if we do what we've been doing forever, we might not change anything and the attitudes and everything is not going to change education in, in, in a way. So we need to revisit our techniques, our attitudes. In Mariana's case, uh, the lessons are going to be completely different because the group is different. If one element is different, it's, it moves into a different group, right? Um, and this is um, somehow not standardized education, like this is the program, everybody has to do this by this time. You may have students doing different things and your special, uh, the, the student with special needs doing different things at different points, but it doesn't mean they're not learning, but each one of them is learning at their own rate, okay? Um, I'm not going to skip this, but I'm going to go through this very quickly. It has uh, to do with projects and it's a bit more complex in terms of how to motivate students. And this is uh, one of the hows that might help us in terms of using projects and engaging them through continual, uh, the continuous um, sustained behavior for all the process there. But it's a bit deeper in, in, in research and using and encouraging uh, consistent um, action and studying, right? I promise I'm not going to be late, Barbara. Promise a little bit. Just again, if we talk about constructivism and the constructivist uh, view of motivation, we know that you can be motivated differently. We, we are all different, as I said, but it has to do with what Mariana has just asked, right? The social and the contextual influence um, are actually going to help um, a lot. Um, I was going to, to, to tell you a story, but we don't have time. No stories, no stories, Barbara, I promise. But the context influences, and it can influence positively or negative, negatively. And if we teachers, we facilitate it and we organize it and we promote it in a more constructive way, it will grow and help everyone in the group grow differently at different rates, but as a group, growing okay um as i said in mariana's answer that mariana's question it's very difficult for us to find or not very difficult it is but it's a challenge um and the real challenge in education lies in um promoting or looking for in terms of effective learning looking for equity in learning and how we can as teachers find 
differentiation, the needed differentiation for us to uh, balance the students who will learn despite the teacher. So how we can challenge them to perform better a little more than what they've been doing, how I can help those who seem to be underperforming because they need more support, give them more support so that they can perform uh, better and how I can help students speak if they need, for example, it could be um, Ronaldo's students' case, they, they need more uh, language for the task or they need more prompts or they need to feel safe um, with written notes to be able to speak. I don't know. So how I can find the, the specifics uh, in each group for my students that is going to help everyone thrive in that environment. And it goes um, hand in hand with um, obviously assessment. Okay, don't forget that. Putting a bit of things together, it has to do with the consistency of our own actions. Remember what I said about the students who said I believed in her? Maybe I was uh, not as aware as I am of uh, the importance of that, but this is one of the things that helps us the most in helping students succeed. It's to believe that they can. It's to believe first and foremost that with our help, with their efforts, their efforts, that's very important, uh, with their participation, with everyone's involvement, they can go beyond. So if we don't believe that, let's go back to the first question why we teach and rethink, okay? Because if we go to the classroom with a belief that mm, that student will never learn, there's something wrong with us, not with the student. Um, because we haven't done everything or we haven't found, and it's okay for us not to be able to find a way to help that student. We remember what I said, we are superheroes, but not super superheroes. And sometimes you can't, and it's okay to ask for help. Okay, but believing that they cannot do something is a different thing. Okay, knowing that we might not be able to help them is okay. And the same thing, the same thing is actually reinforced again, right? What we do, what we believe in, our attitudes are actually going to affect learners' achievement, their motivation, and everything. The, this awareness is key. I'm going to just summarize it, I promise. It's because it's just the, 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 the notes there. I said habits, attitudes, what we do, right? How we talk to our colleagues, how we contribute, be it uh, in the school. One thing, if you planned one thing, and I have one activity here, I have an idea here, building trust with a group, with a group of teachers, with your groups of learners and cohesion, this is going to help you. Uh, final words, focus, not final, there is one more word. Focus on what each student has to bring to the collective. Highlight positive feelings towards the, the, what they are doing, what they do. The beauty is that in learning from others and actually see the world differently through someone else's perspective, like empathizing with your students, okay? Um, and most importantly, helping each other like we are doing right now, asking the questions and Perhaps later we can keep discussing Marcio, um, Susana, Ronaldo, Mariana, um, helping one another, lighting, lighting, uh, lightning uh, anybody else's um, sparkles in teaching or empowering others will actually positively affect your own power. Because if you're in the room and you are one candle and if you light all the others, we can actually change um, the whole educational world together, okay? Thank you very much. Uh, these are my contacts if you want to contact me. Um, part of the context, because otherwise it would be like 10 different emails. And Barbara, do we have any other questions or can I go to the surprise? Hi, Marcella. Thanks everybody for joining us. 
you can go to the surprise. Oh, uh, before before you go to the surprise, uh, some folks are asking if you could make the this presentation available. Yes, I can. I can uh, make it into a um, PDF, which is going to be easier, and you can distribute, or you can just send me an email, and I send you. Um, the, the references and, and the, the, the folks and everything. Okay. Uh, okay. Awesome. So let's go to your surprise. Surprise. Uh, as you could see, press Cecil. Oops, press Cecil. It's not mirrored. Press Cecil is um, actually giving you a voucher for um, one year membership. Okay. And it's going to be a very simple way. You can think of a word that summarizes um, everything we talked about today. And the first the first word in the chat is going to win the annual membership. It has to be one word, okay? If you have three words, no way, one word. That summarizes. I'm looking at the chat. I'm looking at the chat. I'm looking at the chat. I don't, I don't know many messages popping at the same time. Affection, love, knowledge. Okay, what was the first one? Empower, empowerment. Just a second. The first one was Maria Angela da Silva. Am I right, guys? Let me know. She said love. And then we have empowerment, empowering, love, and empathy. Lots of different words. Students, oh, I love this one. But it's not, I said the first one, okay? Rules are rules. I cannot even choose, care, love, all of them together. Wonderful. Fantastic. Barbara, am I right? This is the first one because I'm terrible at looking at the... No, uh, everybody is popping comments. Uh, yeah. The first, I one... Saw, uh, uh, the first one I saw is from Jordan. Uh, I'm trying to find him. Uh, Jordan. I, I, oh, my God. I can't find him. I lost him. <laughs> First one I saw was Maria Angela da Silva, but I can try to find Jordan. Oh, uh, Maria, it's Maria Angela or Maria Angela? You were Maria Angela da Silva. At Maria Angela da Silva. Let us check if if she's subscribed to the event, so she can win. I, I just mm. found, found her comment here. Uh, it uh, Maria Angela da Silva. Is she subscribed? Let me find her here. <laughs> but there's, there's a lot of subscription. Uh, I'm trying to read the comments. Thank you very much. You're wonderful here. I love surprise. Me too. Uh, let, there's a lot of Marias here. <laughs> uh, Maria Angela da Silva. I guess she's not subscribed to the event. Oh my oh, God. No. So uh, the second one in my screen is Empowerment by Tatia Onorato. Tatia Onorato? No, Tatia. T H A T I A. Oh, I just found her. Tatia Onorato is, is the winner, I guess. Yay. Yay. <laughs> Tatia Onorato is one, here. Right? She subscribed. Yay. Wonderful. Yay. Congratulations. So, uh, Tatia, uh, could you please send, uh, we're going to send you an email so you can uh, send your data for us to send you your voucher, okay? Great. Uh, thanks a lot for joining us, everybody. Uh, we're going to contact Tatia and thanks a lot, Marcela, for your, Thank your you. amazing lecture and hope to see you guys soon. Uh, right now, we're going to uh, Raquel Ribeiro's lecture that will be in English. And if you want to download your certificates, it's on the link of the description of the video, right? Thanks a lot, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. Thank you.